<clears throat> okay. Hi everyone, this is Russell Arnold again for thepuffery.com. Australia, they are the champions for the fifth time in World Cup history. Dominant performance and they say generally you must look to peak um, at the business end and that's what Australia did. They were looking for a complete performance and they were able to produce that in the World Cup final. What an atmosphere, what a uh, stage to perform on. 93,000 people in the stadium at the MCG. Uh, the previous highest for a cricket match on a single day had been 91. People from all over the world had also traveled to see this spectacle, but were disappointed to the, to the uh, why I mean disappointed is there was no game. Australia so dominant and it was a one-sided affair in that sense. Both teams going into the game unchanged from their semi-final lineups. Good pitch, and we know at the MCG, you need 300 runs. The moment you put up 300 runs, the opposition can't get there. There's always something in the pitch and you're able to get through. That's what history says. New Zealand won the toss, elected to bat first. No hesitation from McCullum. And both camps, they sounded relaxed. But come the first ball, Mitchell Stark turned it on. You always want that first over, the start to be precise. Start strong, they said. And what a first over from Mitchell Stark. Fast and straight. And McCullum faced three balls. He was the non-striker for the first ball. Got on strike and three balls. Even before he could lift his bat, the ball was through to the keeper. Yes, that's the way he plays. He takes uh, the initiative and goes after the bowlers. But for the first time, he was up against Stark in the first over. Someone bowling at 150 much quicker than the bowlers that he had faced before. And Mitchell Stark too, right on the money. Couple of swipes, just missed the stumps. And the moment he rattled the stumps with the third ball, we all felt, wow, Australia are on their way. And they were on their way. All the other bowlers chipping in, great lines, great lengths. The fielders also well on top of their game. And New Zealand really struggled to get on top of the scoreboard. Not moving at all. Williamson and Guptill followed. Soft dismissals, but that was the pressure that was being built by the Australian bowlers. From 3 for 39, there came a partnership, a very slow one. And Ross Taylor, who had been very scratchy throughout the tournament, striking at about 60. Very unusual because the, all the other batsmen have been hitting at over 100. Uh, uh, strike rates of over 100. But Ross Taylor, though he's getting runs, may have even scored more than McCullum. But that strike rate, not an impact. Anyway, once they got to the batting power play with 150 on the board, it looked like New Zealand will give themselves a chance. 275 was on the cards because Anderson and Ronke to follow. If they could get there, they're in with a chance because their bowlers are good. But was not to be. The first ball had Ross Taylor out. James Faulkner's wide Yorker and Taylor was nick nicking through. Anderson came in and it seemed... Uh, that that was the changing point. Taylor's catch, in fact, was a brilliant one by Brad Haddon. Catchers win matches, they say he was diving low to his right and he picked up Taylor. A wicket from nowhere and Australia were back in the game and they didn't look back from there on. Anderson cleaned up for a second ball duck and it was that time that the shadows were creeping in and you could see that half the pitch uh, was covered uh, by a shadow and for a new batsman going in, light to darkness or darkness to light, uh, and with the pressure of the situation, judging that ball as early as he should uh, can be a challenge. And I think that's what we saw. Ronke also went for a fourth ball duck in the next over to Mitchell Stark. And the innings quickly folded away. 183 or 45 overs was never going to be enough. I never even felt like the New Zealand bowlers had enough to produce what we saw in Auckland. We thought that uh, Australia will get over the line very easy. Grant Elliott, he continued from where he left off and unfortunately was dismissed on 83 of 82 balls. He was the only batsman to take it to the Australian bowlers. He was batting well and when he tried to hoik the slower ball of Faulkner and the top edge went straight into the hands of Haddon, it felt, yes, it's not their day at all. Mitchell Stark, 2 for 20. How good was he? Setting the tone. You have to win moments in matches and winning a moment as early as that against a batsman like McCullum would mean you're setting your team on its way. And that's exactly what happened. Hazelwood was good. Eight overs, none for 30. But Mitchell Johnson, 
three wickets at the top and came up to two wickets at the top and came back to clean up uh, uh, the latter part of the innings. Three for 30 to him. Maxwell picked up the big wicket of uh, Guptill and James Faulkner. When New Zealand were rebuilding, he's the one who made the difference. Out came Australia and there was a glimmer of hope. Finch getting his foot right in front inside edge onto the pad and he looped back to Bolt at one for two. You just felt whether the interest is going to come back into the game. But Warner and Stephen Smith saw off any threat. Warner went on to make 45 and then the partnership of 112 between Smith and the captain, Michael Clark. Michael Clark playing his last game, 74 of 72. And what a way to sign off, making a telling contribution. Yes, the pressure was not on and the run started flowing towards the end. But he was determined. He looked as good as he has ever done uh, when batting out there in these innings. And just on Michael Clark, the Australian team left uh, the team hotel at 12.30 for the 2.30 start. But around 11, 11.15, Michael Clark was out there at the MCG on the pitch, visualizing what he should be doing. Lots of batsmen do that. Just soak in the atmosphere. Just get those lines and, ri uh, lines and lengths right by just pretending to play the ball and just getting your mind tuned. Michael Clark, on his own, was out there an hour before the Australian team left their hotel. That's how focused he was. And knowing that it's his last game too, for himself and also for the team, um, a good knock from him would certainly have sealed it. That's how big players tend to look at things. If I perform today, if I get my 100 or 150 runs, then the team is well on its way to win. And that's exactly what Michael Clark was doing. Got himself out just before the end and was clapped off and a standing ovation from the 93,000 strong, uh, 93, strong crowd. But unlike when the best player or the top scorer for New Zealand was sledged off by the Australians, all the New Zealanders ran up to Clark to congratulate him. A seven-wicket victory, an easy win in the end, and Australia ending up far too good for the New Zealanders. But it's been a magnificent ride for the New Zealanders. They've thrilled everyone, their preparation, the type of cricket they played uh, was outstanding. And the first game that they had to play outside their home country. Now, I don't think there was too much different in the pitch, uh, but in New Zealand, the ball tends to swing a little bit more. But the boundaries, they're a big difference. Smaller grounds in uh, New Zealand, bigger ones here in Australia. But if you want to be the champions, you have to adjust. New Zealand, they didn't even get to breathe today. Mitchell Stark dealt that early blow and Australia on their way. So a lot to look forward to. A lot of champions um, leaving the game after this World Cup. Michael Clark, Daniel Vittori, uh, the two Sri Lankan legends, Miss Bowlhawk, Shahid Afridi. So lots of changes to cricket when we see international teams playing out there again. Mitchell Stark, man of the tournament, 22 wickets at a superb average of 10.18 uh, and an economy rate of 3.5. When you consider that to how the other bowlers have been travelling, he's been outstanding. Trent Bolt also picked up 22 wickets at 16.86 and an economy rate of 4.36. So the two left-armers for both teams leading the way. And Martin Guttil just snuck past uh, Kumar Sangakkara to finish as the leading scorer uh, of the World Cup. Of course, Martin Guttil had two extra innings. So that's it. The much look forward to World Cup has come and gone. And Australia, worthy champions. Well, I was rooting for New Zealand. I thought they were deserving to. They deserved to win this, uh, just because of the way they were playing, and um, this was their best possible chance. But in the end, Australia just too good, far too good for anyone. It's theirs, the World Cup for now. It's Russell Arnold for the Papre dot com. Yeah, I mean Danish Avila. Oh, my message, my friend.